Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much uh, for those that invited me to come and make you feel uncomfortable at this conference. And of course, I, I want to say this, that I couldn't give you an anxious thought. It's only the Spirit of God and the Word of God that can make you feel uncomfortable. I can't really do that. But, but God can. And uh, sometimes when the Word of God is lifted up before us, it does indeed make us feel uncomfortable. But the purpose is good. It's that we might change, that we might become more like the Lord Jesus and less like ourselves. And we need that. And so the trust thing that this weekend will be life changing. It's not just a case of another conference, but we really would desire greatly that our lives would never be the same again. God, we changed. And we become far more disciplined. The word disciple and the word discipline sound a lot alike, don't they? There's a reason for that. Because you can't be a real disciple if you're not disciplined. You're discipline not yourself towards God. You've been saying that, that. You never drift, ever drift into a life of godliness. It will only come because of discipline. We've been thinking about some of the disciplines of the Christian life. We've thought about the discipline of prayer and how it is a great discipline, how difficult it is to pray because our minds wander. Uh, we're so easily distracted. There's so much to do. And we feel, sometimes we feel like, well, I got to do this. Um, and so we're, we're busy. But what we need to realize is that activity that is not based on believing prayer won't really produce much right so we can we can spend our lives like in a vortex of busyness and accomplish nothing <laughs> we need to be coming out from the presence of god to minister having spent time in his presence so the discipline of prayer and then the discipline of the word of god you know just the discipline of reading the word of god of of hearing the word of God, of obeying the word of God, of studying the word of God. And now I want to talk about another discipline. Hebrews chapter 10, please, if you'd like to turn there. Hebrews chapter 10. I want to talk about this refresher course in the basics. I want to talk about the discipline of assembly life. Life in a local scriptural New Testament assembly. And Hebrews 10 we we'll begin reading, it says, uh, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. And then how do all these things happen when it says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And even more so as the day approaches. Now, what day is that? Well, it's, it's the coming of Christ, right? And as we get closer to the coming of Christ, as the world becomes more evil, as perilous times come, we need each other more than we've ever needed each other. We need the mutual encouragement to exalt one another, to, to love and good works, all of these things. And that's all done in the context of coming together, gathering together to the name of the Lord Jesus. And I can say this dogmatically and without fear of contradiction, that it's God's will for you to be in fellowship in a scripturally gathered New Testament assembly. Now, that's a sweeping dogmatic statement, but I've got biblical reason for saying it. Why is the church so important? Let me just begin with this statement. Ephesians 5.25 says this, Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So obviously, the church must be significant because it's something that Christ loves so much that he gave himself for her. And, and surely, we should love what he loves. He loves the church. We should love the church. We should give ourselves. He gave himself for it in death. We should give ourselves for the thing that the Lord loves. So to be like Christ, we need to love what he loves. 
Uh, look at John's Gospel, chapter two. I want you to see an amazing thing uh, that it, it says about the Lord Jesus. And, and when I said this dogmatic statement about the idea of God's will for your life to be a part of uh, and involved in a functioning New Testament church, the reason I said that is because, uh, because in chapter two of John, verse 17, it says this, his disciples remembered that it was written, written of Jesus, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. I love that scripture. What it's saying is, zeal for God's house consumed the Savior. Isn't that an amazing statement? Consumed it. The zeal of your house. And remember, it's a quote from Psalm 69, a messianic psalm. That the disciples remembered the scripture said that. And, and of course, the context is Jesus had just cleansed the temple. It, it's not what it ought to be. And so his zeal for the house of God, they saw the blazing of his eyes as he threw the money changes out of the temple. And they said, the zeal for God's house is eaten me up. Now, why I can say this is, see, God's will for you is for you to be like Christ. Right? That, I've got a biblical reason for saying that, don't I? God's predestinated us to be conformed to the image of his son. That's what the word of God says. And so he wants you to be like Jesus. And you can't be like Jesus if you're indifferent about the church. Now, you might be like him in lots of other ways. But you can't be fully like Christ if you're indifferent about the church because zeal for the house of God consumed him, and we're supposed to be like him. So if I don't have a zeal for the house of God, then I'm not like Christ. And I'm not how I should be, because God saved me to make me like his son. He's so in love with his son, he wants to fill heaven with people like him. And we don't have to wait till we get to heaven to be like him. We should be more like him every single day. But we, one area where I can be sure I can be like him is if I have a zeal for the house of God. Whereas if I'm indifferent, if I don't really care about it, if I don't really invest in it, then I'm just not Christ-like in that area. And of course, the house of God in the day of the Lord Jesus was the temple. But in our day, we don't have any difficulty in understanding what the house of God is. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Marvelous scripture, but it tells us clearly what the house of God is in this dispensation, this age. It says in First Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So the house of God in our dispensation, in our age, is the church of the living God. By the way, notice that he's writing to Timothy, who's in Ephesus. And in Ephesus, there's a house of a god there. That's the temple of Diana. And she was this goddess. Actually, she was a meteorite that fell from heaven that looked like a many-breasted woman. So it was a goddess of fertility. And they, they worshipped a piece of rock. We do not worship, we worship the one who is the rock. <laughs> uh, scripture says that, but he is the living God. He's a living savior. Everything about his life and the church is the church of the living God. And this is where we, we come together. This is where we gather. We gather to the name of the Lord Jesus as New Testament believers in the house of God capacity. It's the church of the living God. Now, look at Acts chapter 2. I want you to see a simple thing in the New Testament. Uh, often we do this when we were in Ireland. We were missionaries in Ireland. We do Bible studies, evangelistic Bible studies. And when, when people would respond to the gospel and get saved... The next thing we do, the following study, we say, okay, what happens now in the New Testament when somebody got saved? What next? Okay, now you've trusted in Christ, you've trusted in the finish. What next? Well, it's really easy. Acts 2, 41 says this. It says, they that gladly received his word. Now, it's not easy to receive his word because when we gladly receive his word, what we're saying is, Yes, I am a dirty, rotten, hell-deserving sinner. That's not easy for a proud man 
to accept, right? So receiving his word is saying, I, I, I agree with God. I am a hell-deserving sinner. I can't save myself. There's only one Savior. It's the Lord Jesus, and I believe in him. That's receiving his word. And when they've done that, what happened next? It says those that gladly received his word were baptized. And somebody got saved. They got baptized. In fact, uh, in the New Testament, usually it was the day that they got saved, they got baptized. No probational baptism. No, they just got, they got saved, they got baptized. And then it says, what happened next? It says <laughs> the same day they were added unto them, about 3,000 souls. So remember, we, we started in Acts with 120 in the upper room. And this is what you call church growth. They went in one sermon from 120 to 3,120. Now that's what you call church growth. Wouldn't you love it that Boker, if he went, I don't know, like, how would you cope? I mean, <laughs> 3,000 converts. I mean, like, it would be a bit crowded here this, this afternoon, wouldn't it? But that's what happened. And they were added unto them. Now, this being added unto them is not a casual thing. Remember, these are people that are despised. Remember, these are people that not long ago, their, their leader, their Messiah had been at the mercy of the mob, crying out, crucify him, crucify him. This is not a social club. These are hated individuals. But they were added unto them. And so the idea is this, that when somebody gets saved, they get baptized, and they become added to the church. Now, we're part of the universal church the minute we're saved. But this is not just talking about the universal church. They're added to them. And, and so much so that this adding to them, these 3,000 souls, it resulted in certain activities. Verse 42, they continued steadfastly to do certain things. Apostle doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. And so basically, it's speaking about the local testimony in Jerusalem. They were added to them. And, they, and notice, they continued steadfastly. That's strong language. The word steadfast there, it means fixed as in purpose. It's, it's, it's like being stuck to something like glue. They were just determined. No matter what, they were going to continue steadfast. Not, not, not today. In much of Christianity, we say they continue seldomly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. They continue steadfastly. They stuck to it. They, they continued to meet together, and they met together for four things, what we call the four basic food groups of the New Testament assembly, the apostles' doctrine. They recognized they needed teaching. God gave gifted men to the church to teach the church. They needed instruction. They're new converts. They need to grow. They needed instruction. And so they, they came for apostles' doctrine. And by the way, it must have been fabulous in the early church because the apostles' doctrine was taught by the apostles. <laughs> Can you imagine? You know, kind of, Peter, tell us again about Transfiguration Mountain. What was it like when you were up there and you, you, you saw the Lord, you know, kind of transfigured? And, and, and tell us again about when you were walking on water. You know, tell us again about, about when, when uh, Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead. And so they would tell them these things. Now, we don't have the apostles, but thank God, they, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, wrote all this stuff down. So we have the apostles' doctrine in the word of God. And so they continue separately in the Apostle Doctrine. And then it says, in fellowship. Now, what does this word fellowship mean? Well, it's an interesting word. Look at Luke's Gospel for a second. I just want to talk about what it really means to be in fellowship in a local assembly. Luke 5 and verse 10. It says, and so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon, and Jesus said to Simon, fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Now, the word partners there in Luke 5 and verse 10 is the same Greek word, koinonia, that is translated as fellowship in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. So let me explain what I mean by this. So he's talking about James and John, sons of Zebedee, were partners with Simon. And what were they doing? They were partners in a fishing business. They were fishermen. And so what they did was they worked together, right? They mended nets. They kept the boats in good condition. They went out on the lake. 
<laughs> they shared in all the responsibility of the business. And then that day when the Lord Jesus came and said, put the net on the other side, and they got this big haul of fish, they shared in the blessings. Right? So fellowship means you share in the responsibility of the work of the local assembly. And you get to share in the blessings as well. Now, it's funny because I, I use this illustration. I, I, I go to Spanish wells and uh, they're lobster fishermen. And um, it's uh, usually they club together and they, they buy a boat. Costs, I, I don't know, a lot of money, $250,000, probably more. I have no idea, but it's a lot of money. A lot of investment goes into this. And then they put these traps now at the bottom of the ocean, these little habitats. And, and they have to, uh, you know, kind of mark where they are. And lobsters, you know, they're kind of the, uh, <clears throat> the cockroach of the ocean. <laughs> Uh, they're, they're bottom feet, feet, they go on the bottom and they like dark places. And so they go under these and they breed prolifically, just like cockroaches. And so they, they wait till they get to maturity and then they'll dive down, flip them over and spear them and then bring them back. And so I said to them one day, I said, look, I want to, I want, I want in on one of your ships. I don't want to pay any money and I don't want to do any work. I might occasionally come and sit on a deck chair on the deck and get a suntan and read. But when you get your profits, I want equal share. Now, none of them would have me on their ship. I don't know why. I mean, I'm a nice guy. Why would they not want me on the ship? Because I wanted all the blessings. I didn't want any of the work. And there are many people whose attitude to the local church is, I want all the blessings. I won't do any work. And that's not fellowship. Fellowship is sharing the responsibility and sharing in the blessings. And, and so they continued in the Apostles' Doctrine and fellowship. In other words, they were really committed to this thing, the forwarding of the cause of Christ through the local church there in Jerusalem. They were in. They were all in, every one of them. They were all doing their part to forward the work of Christ and seeing the blessings and enjoying it together. And so they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine and Fellowship. And then in breaking of bread, that was the thing that they did. They, they didn't neglect that. On the first day of the week, they came together. They remembered the Lord together in the breaking of bread, like he told us to do. And that's what they were committed to. And then it says in prayers, they were, they were a people of prayer. We said that. You go through the book of Acts, every time they have a problem, they have a prayer meeting. They were a praying people. And so that's the idea of what happens when somebody gets saved. Biblically, what happens? Not what happens in America. Not what happens in our culture. What happens in Scripture. They get saved, they get baptized, and they continue steadfastly in these things. That if we want to be biblical, not necessarily American, biblical, then we will follow what the New Testament says. We'll do that. We'll do it gladly. Why is it so important? Well, let's just, again, look at Romans chapter 12. I want you just to see. Romans, we've talked about it already. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, fully acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So this idea of consecration, in the light of the mercies of God, you, he says, I beseech you, having gone through the first 11 chapters and explained marvelously the mercies of God as found in the gospel. How should I respond to that? You know, when I think of God's mercy to my cat would a dirty, rotten, hell-deserving sinner who was without excuse before God guilty. And now justified, declared righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. And all the blessings have been brought into. How should you respond to that? Well, you respond to that by presenting your body a living sacrifice. I love Hudson Taylor, one of my heroes. 16 years of age, just overwhelmed at the gospel. Lays prostrate on the ground and said, Lord, I give myself and the rest of my life to you. Do with me whatever you want me to do. And as he got to his feet, the Lord put China on his heart. And the rest of the story is history. Amazing, right? 16-year-old claims a continent for Christ. Uh, it, you go there and, and you talk to, and I've been there to the underground church, and the, the believers, that their hero is Hudson Taylor. Even now, 
Isn't that amazing? A lad from Barnsley, England, presenting himself as a living sacrifice. So, we, we, have you ever done that? And if you've done that, what does it look like? Well, we said he wants your mind first, and he wants to renew your mind. And then he says, verse 3, I say through the grace given to, to, uh, unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Because if you do something like that, the next thing's going to happen is you're going to think, well, what's wrong with the rest of the people? Did they understand the mercies of God? See, the pride of the heart can kick in. And he said, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. You should have done that a long time ago. Why, why, have, you, why have you delayed so long? You don't have anything to boast of. And so don't get, get proud. Um, stay small, stay humble, think soberly about who you are. But then from verse 4 onwards, he starts talking about life in the body. See, so what do you do with this body that you presented to the Lord? You've given him your body. You know what he says? Now use it for my body, the church. You remember Christ is the head, the church is his body. And so he says, verse 4, for as we are met many members in one body, you're part of the body of Christ. All members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry let us wait on ministry, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exalteth on exaltation, he that giveth let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, so on and so forth. What he's saying is this, this consecrated body is now to be used the rest of your day to build up his body, the church. And how you do that is by using the spiritual gift that God has given to you to build up the local church. And, and every gift is meant to be used in the context of the local church, except the evangelist who goes out and brings people into the local church. But even he has a role in the church to teach others how to do the work of an evangelist. So it's not just, so every gift is connected with the church. And so if you're a believer, you're gifted. I'm speaking to the gifted class this evening. Every person in this room is is spiritually engifted by God the Holy Spirit to build up the church. And the problem is that when you're not involved in the church, your gift is not being used to build up the body. And therefore, the body is suffering because of your lack of involvement. And, and so you'll see somebody and, and they're, well, they, they've got a kidney that doesn't work. Are they still alive? but they're not functioning to their greatest capacity, right? Because they've got some internal defective issue that is stopping them from being fully healthy and vibrant. Many a local assembly is struggling because people who are gifted are indifferent about the house of God. And instead of developing their spiritual gift to build up their assembly, they're developing their golf swing or whatever, climbing the career ladder, whatever they're doing. That they're not using. And so the church is hurting. It's suffering. And what do you think it's going to be like when we stand before the Lord Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ? I saved you. I gave you that gift so that you could build up the testimony to my name in that area. You didn't do it. But that's to me. You gotta, you gotta think in terms of that day. There's a, there's a day coming when we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and we'll give an account for the things done in this body, whether good or worthless. And so, I want to be able to give an account with joy and say, Lord, I, I knew what my gift was, and I used it with all the energy that I had, and depending on Your Spirit to build up Your assembly. I'd like to be able to think that. The other, the other things about the church, it's got school. It's, it's where we learn doctrine. It's where we learn patience. Because the church, the problem with the church is, it's going to be perfect someday, but it's not perfect yet. And some of the Christians are hard to live with. Now, I'm sure... None of them in Boca Raton are like that. But in many, many places, we have what I call sandpaper saints. 
They just know how to rub you up the wrong way. And we have to learn to live with them so that we learn patience and forbearance and long suffering. And, and again, one thing that helps us to learn these things is when we remember how patient and long suffering and forbearing the Lord is with us. Like, has he been in any way like that in your life? He certainly has in my life. But the saints teach you how to really love. Love when it's hard. Love when it's difficult. Love when they just seem to know how to hit your trigger buttons. <laughs> and we've got to respond to that in grace and love. And so it's a wonderful school. You can't learn that if you're not in fellowship. You know, the problem is in our culture, this is just a general statement, but it's true. And that is we live in a society where people run away from difficulty. They, um, they have a problem in their marriage and I'm out of this. I'm gone. I'm done. And they think that they're escaping the problem. Then they get married again. But guess what? They import the garbage from the last marriage into the next one. And then they say, I'm out of here. Well, job is difficult. I'm, I'm done. I'm out of here. Class at school, I quit. We're, we're, we're a society of people who have learned to run away from problems. You know what that results in? Perpetual immaturity. Bunch of babies. Because we never learn to work through problems. My wife and I have been married 40 years. We're both sinners. We're both selfish sinners. Do you think we've had an idyllic marriage? We've had some issues. We've had difficulties. We're different people. She's English and uh, Irish and I'm English. That's a, that's a problem right there. We've been at war for 800 years. So what do you do? You learn. You learn when to be quiet, to choose your battles, to, to, to you grow together as heirs of the grace of life. And because you work through difficulties together, you have a deeper love for one another. It's amazing. And so when it comes to the local church, it's a place where we learn these things. Book of Ephesians chapter 4. I just want you to see this. I'm not making this stuff up. This is all from the word of God. It, it says, um, uh, verse 2, with all holiness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace bearing with one another in love. And you can't learn that anywhere. Else. The local church is God's school to learn these things. It's a place where we can learn service, to be like the master. Remember the Lord took a towel and washed the disciples' feet. And he said, I've done it. this is an example that you took following my footsteps. And so here's a lot of glory getting down and washing the disciples' feet. And we have so many opportunities for service in the local assembly. To, to minister to one another. The Lord Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Do we believe that? That's what he said. More blessed to give. Well, there's lots of opportunities to give in the local assembly. Give of your time. Give of your, your, your physical labor. Give of, of the exercise of your gift to give financially. Lots of ways to give. And so... Service, the word minister, it's not a clerical title. It just simply means servant. And we're all New Testament ministers. And where, we, where do we do our ministry? Well, the local church. That's the place where God wants us to serve. There's so many practical things. There's a cleaning rotor. Isn't it nice to come into a clean building? But it doesn't get there by magic. Somebody has to do it. So pray, pray professionals or we, we do it ourselves. Uh, cutting the grass, keeping the grounds, visiting the sick, the widows, the elderly, setting up chairs and tables for different meetings, track distribution, teaching Sunday school classes, opportunities to serve are absolutely endless in the church. And to serve Christ, who is the head of the church in the process. Opportunity to teach your children service, both by example and opportunity. And attitude is the key. I, th I think as we come to the local church, we need to come with this attitude. Apostle Paul, uh, when he was converted, some of the first words out of his mouth were this, Lord, 
what will thou have me to do? Wouldn't it be refreshing if somebody came to join in fellowship in your assembly and said, look, I'm just here. What would you have me to do? I'll do anything, no matter what, what it is, I, I'll do it. Wouldn't you love that? Well, that's what Paul said, right? In the beginning of his Christian world, what would you have me to do? He didn't say, look, here's what I can do, and I'm going to give you these. You know, he just said, Lord, what would you have me to do? He didn't know what the Lord was going to say to him. But he, he came with that lovely attitude. Lord, what would you have me to do? You've done so much for me. Lord, what would you have me to do? Isn't that a beautiful attitude? If we could come to the local assembly with that attitude, it'd be wonderful. Problem is, we often ask the wrong question. We'll come to a church, we'll say, what's in it for me? That's the mentality of today. What's in it for me? It's like, it's American consumerism at its worst. I want cruise, tilt, leather. Oh, you know, it's like buying a car. So we come to a local church, well, I want this, 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 and this. I need this for my kids, I need this, this. Instead of coming and saying, what can I do to be a blessing? That's a different mentality, isn't it? John F. Kennedy said this. He said, don't ask what can my country do for me. Well, he needs to, somebody needs to preach that to our country today. Don't ask what can my country do for me, but what can I do for my country? If we came to the assembly and said, don't ask what can my assembly do for me, but what can I do for the assembly? And if we really believe the Lord said it's more blessed to give than receive, we'd actually be better off. And the assembly would be too. Certainly one thing about, just this is a, a kind of an Old Testament illustration, but it's, I, I've often had this in my mind, that in the book of Numbers, when they were going through the wilderness, and they were living in tents, if you know, and, they, and in the middle of the camp was the tabernacle, which was at that time the house of God. The interesting thing is that all the tribes surrounded the house of God. And when they opened their tent door in the morning, the first thing they saw was the house of God. And the point was this, their lives revolved around the house of God. It was kind of central to everything they do. In the book of Numbers, their warriors, their worshipers, their, work, their, their workers, their witnesses. But everything that they did, it resolved, revolved around the house of God. And, and so <laughs> I think it's true to say that that's the way our lives should be. Uh, in some ways, the motor car has made things more difficult. In days gone by, often uh, a, a meeting hall would be in a community and everybody in the community would live around the hall and they would all come to the fellowship. Now we can live miles away, but nevertheless, it still needs to be central in our lives. Our lives ordered around the house of God. Sadly, for many of us, our priorities are twisted. Work, family, pleasure, all those things come before the house of God. And we can glibly quote the scriptures, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But often in practice, it's not first. He's not first. His interests are not first. The first commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me. Which means that he and his interests should have first place in our lives. A statement I heard years ago, and it's never, ever left my mind. It says this, if everyone in the assembly was like me, what kind of an assembly would there be? In fact, I encourage you, if you want an assignment, to write that out. I'll say it again so you can get it. If everyone in the assembly was like me, what kind of an assembly would there be? And stick it up in the mirror in your bathroom so you see it every single day. As a reminder, if everyone in the assembly was like me, what kind of an assembly would there be? So what should we be? Well, be there. That's number one. Make it a life decision. Don't wait to Sunday morning to decide whether you're going to go again. My wife and I made the decision 40 years ago. We'll be there. Right? Bill McDonald used to say, if you check the newspaper and your name is not in the obituary column, you should be at the meeting. So I checked. I'm not there. My name is not in the obituary column. 
They should be here, right? That, I think that's just a simple thing. Be there. You, you can't not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. And what's amazing is COVID has really done a number on that, right? Because, because the saints have been crippled by fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear. That's, that's not from God. And look, worst case scenario, you could go to heaven. That's best case scenario, isn't it? You know what I'm saying, though? I mean, come on, let's think through these things. Be there. Make it a life decision. Be prepared. Come prepared to participate. The, the Corinthian believers, look at 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. You can say a lot of criticisms about Corinth. One thing you can't fault them for is their enthusiasm. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Says, How is it then, brethren, when you come together... By the way, they did come together. We have to say that. They did gather together. Every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. In other words, they came, they were loaded. Their baskets were full. They were just, they couldn't wait to get there. They had something to share. Isn't that amazing? They came prepared. <coughs> Be prepared. Come to the Bible study. Prepared. Come to the prayer meeting. Prepared to pray. I'm always amazed that... Uh, the, we said last night, the men pray everywhere, and you come to prayer meetings, and there are men, and they never pray. And they have the response, and they never open their mouths. And yet afterwards, I remember, I'll never forget this, there was, was a Zoom prayer meeting, because it was, a, I don't know, it was in a, a state that was democratically run, so um, the, um, the laws were stricter, and so this assembly were kind of be good i suppose and and so anyway they had a prayer meeting and um there was long awkward silences and then there was a break and the same men that had nothing to say couldn't stop talking like it wasn't that they lost their voices it wasn't that they but they didn't pray i think what a shame why would you come to a prayer meeting and not have a heart to pray staggering be there, be prepared, be sensitive to the needs of others. We're, we're, we're coming to minister. Sometimes I'll go to our assembly, my wife and I will pray on the way, Lord, who do you want us to minister today? Whether I'm speaking or not, it's irrelevant. Who do you want us to minister? Do you want us, maybe you just want us to be a listening ear. Maybe you want us just to put our arms around some struggling saint and say, can we pray with you? But we, we come with this, like, how can we serve today? What can, how can we minister to the people of God today in some way? Show us, Lord. Give us a sensitivity to your spirit so we know how to respond. Be sensitive. Be positive. Complainers and bad attitudes are like the flu. They spread very quickly. Look for good in others and in the assembly. Look for the good things to say. Yeah, it's not perfect. But there's a lot of good. We have some very, our assembly is the smallest. We have some very faithful brethren. We have one brother, um, Ashish knows him. Um, he's in a wheelchair. And uh, he, for him to get to meeting is a major ordeal. Boy, he's faithful. And I've never heard him complain. In years. I mean, I've known him for years. I've never heard him complain once. I think, God, every time I go there, that brother speaks to me without opening his mouth. Just his attitude. It's wonderful. Praise God for that, right? Be, be positive. Be persuaded. What I mean by that is that I fellowship in a scriptural New Testament assembly because I see it in the word of God. And I couldn't go anywhere else. My conscience wouldn't allow me because I see what the scripture teaches about the assembly. And so be persuaded. Be, if you're not sure, study it yourself. That's what I did. I studied it out. And I, I saw what the Bible taught about plurality of eldership, about the role of women in the church, about how the New Testament church was edified, how it functioned. And I see it in the word of God. And I think, God, your plan is better than any of man's pragmatic ideas. I believe that you know better than they do. I believe God. Be punctual. Be early. Don't be like a herd of wildebeest coming in 10 minutes after the meeting starts, please. Get there on time. You can do it. We had five kids. And we were never late. My wife got everything ready Saturday night. 
Jewish principle. They'd always get the day before, they'd get ready for the Sabbath. Well, why not do that? You can do that. Saturday night, get all the clothes laid out on the bed, get them bathed and scrubbed and clean, and then you'll be there. You, you do what you want to do. If you were going to the Super Bowl, I'll guarantee you wouldn't be late. But why anybody want to watch American football is a mystery to me <laughs> as an Englishman. But, but you know what I'm saying? You, you'd be there. The assembly is meant to be a way of life. Notice back in Hebrews 10, we talked about not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. But it's also interesting that it says in the previous verses, let us consider one another, provoke one another to love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of, the, of ourselves together as a matter of some is, but exalting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. But, but how often are we to do these things? How often should we encourage and exalt one another? Well, I think the scripture says we're to encourage and exalt one another daily while it's today. And so there needs to be an involvement in each other's lives. Assembly testimony is not just about the regular meetings. The Christians, they, they were in each other's homes all the time. They were family. They were real family. And are we a family? Is, is Boca Raton Bible Chapel a family? Should be. The family of God. And we should be fellowshipping together, using the home, hospitality. Uh, look at Acts 2. We talked at 41 and 42, but Acts 2, 46. We, we see, again, this was these people loved each other. and They loved being together. They loved encouraging one another and being involved in each other's lives. Acts 2, 46. It, it, it says this, that that and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and in breaking bread from house to house, they eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They love to be with the people of God. And so we should love to be with God's people at every opportunity. And the practice of hospitality is a vital, vital thing in terms of New Testament life. Being in one of those homes, having a home that's open to the people of God. It's wonderfully instructive. I think of the, uh, the godly men we've had in our home over the years and the impact they've had on our lives, but on our children. It's amazing, that some of the godly people. And so just can I say this, that it's a discipline. Uh, to, it's a commitment and it's a discipline. It's a discipline to be present at the assembly meetings. It really is. And to be prepared, all these are disciplines to be to be ready to be on time. It's, it's a discipline, but it's a delight. I don't want you just to get the discipline part. We want to get the discipline part, but we need to see the delight part of it. It's a delight to be with God's people. It's a delight to be used in some way to minister to God's people, to seek to build up the thing that Christ loves. Christ loves the church. Do you love the church? Do you like Christ like that? He had a zeal for the house of God. Do you have a zeal for the house of God? Are you consumed, eaten up with a zeal for the house of God? Wanting it to prosper. Wanting the lampstand here to shine brightly for Jesus Christ. Well, that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? May God encourage us with these things. They got challenges with these things. Yeah, it might be, feel uncomfortable, but we'll feel a lot more comfortable if you obey the word of God. All your discomfort will disappear in a moment when you obey the scriptures. May God help us. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for this uh, lovely day we've had together. We pray, Lord, as we leave here, we do want to uh, ask that you would, uh, Lord, just not allow this to be information that reaches our heads. But, Lord, we want it to be sink down to our hearts and we wanted to engage our wills so that we actually put it into practice and we become people who are known for obedience to the word of God and in the process to be transformed to be like the Lord Jesus. Lord, give us a heart like your son. Give us a heart that has a zeal for the house of God like he had. Make us more like thy son and less like ourselves, and will give thee all the praise and all the glory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you, Brother Mike. Thank you for making us more uncomfortable again, but we know it's God's, God's word that um, speaks to us, so we're, we're grateful for that. Um, um, thank you, too, for the wonderful music and for you guys coming up and, and singing. We appreciate it so much. And um, just safe travels as we head home and God's blessing on, on each. And tomorrow morning, breaking the bread at 9.30, and then we'll have our final message from Brother Mike at 11 o'clock. And so we look forward to that. So good travels.